one of the best things to have ever happened to the crypto space long term is likely keeping the price of Bitcoin lower than it should be. Centralized cryptocurrency exchanges, other big financial businesses, and the exponentially growing institutional investment in Bitcoin is a double-edged sword that is helping make the crypto industry more mainstream while also suppressing its price. Bitcoin was created to be a retail asset for the people where we could completely control and own this new unique form of property. But in recent years, it has been corrupted by traditional mainstream financial markets. Surprise, surprise. So let's dive in and look at what may be a key factor in Bitcoin's current price so we can make better investment decisions as crypto investors in the market, both short and long term. So to help us wrap our heads around how certain aspects of traditional financial instruments applied to Bitcoin are suppressing its price, first, we need to understand the difference between equity-based assets and debt-based assets. Equity-based assets. Equity is just a fancy financial term that describes value or conveys ownership of value. So the word equity is commonly used to describe ownership of shares in a company like stocks or the percentage of ownership someone might have in a company or real estate. For example, if your house is worth $100,000 and you paid $50,000 up front for the house and got a mortgage to cover the other $50,000, then you have 50% equity in the house. So that 50% equity conveys the amount of value of the asset that you own. Cool. So your house in this example is an equity-based asset. So what is an asset? Asset is another fancy financial term that just means something useful or valuable. It can be something physical like gold. It can be something digital like Bitcoin. It can be something abstract like expertise. It can be a financial instrument like a retirement account. And it can be anything that helps you generate income like a computer or cell phone, for example. So your house is an equity-based asset because there is a real underlying valuable asset, that being the land and the house on top of it. Same with stocks. Shares of stocks are equity-based assets because there is real underlying value that is determined by the free market. Free market in that stocks are bought and sold on the market with stock exchanges, where whatever buyers are willing to pay or sellers are willing to accept for certain stocks determine their price. So Bitcoin as a new digital asset was designed to be an equity-based currency and has been accepted by the free market as an asset, as we can see from its amazing upward price movements since it was created over a decade ago. Nice. Now that we understand the concept of equity-based assets, let's explore a major transition that occurred in the US economy to better understand how the US dollar went from an equity-based currency to what it is today. Before the US dollar went off the gold standard, the US was an equity-financed economy meaning all of the debt borrowed by corporations outside of the financial realm was backed by real money and savings accounts. So basically the total dollar value of savings made by people and companies in the real economy equaled the total amount of debt corporations borrowed to grow their businesses. During this time, we were saving more of the money that we earned rather than using it to consume or buy products and services. So we consumed less than we produced. Also during this time, debt in the US economy was backed by real US dollars, and US dollars were backed by gold, hence the equity-based monetary system, where money was backed by actual valuable underlying assets. So after the US abandoned the gold standard, the US turned into a debt-based economy and started using circulation credit or fractional reserve banking. And if you'd like to learn more about fractional reserve banking and the current structure of the traditional financial ecosystem, check out my video guide for beginners by clicking on the link above. Cool. Now let's explore debt-based assets. In a debt-based economy that uses circulation credit or fractional reserve banking, instead of debt being completely backed 100% by cash, the banks are allowed to keep only a fraction of the cash and lend out the rest in ad finitum. For example, let's say for every $100 you deposit into your bank account, Per the fractional reserve banking system, the bank only has to keep $10 of the total deposit and is allowed to lend out the rest. This fraction of deposits the bank are required to maintain are known as reserves. So the $10 fraction of the $100 you deposit into your bank account is held as reserves. And the fraction of deposits banks are required to maintain are known as reserve requirements. Hence the term fractional reserve banking. And since the US abandoned the gold standard, all this cash and fractions of cash banks are required to maintain is now debt-based. Back when the US dollar was backed by gold, cash was an equity-based asset. Now the US dollar is a fiat currency that functions as a medium of exchange. So one, it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, which is not much these days, and two, 
The U.S. government declares that the U.S. dollar must be used to buy and sell goods and services in the United States. So the U.S. dollar is a loan or a note. In fact, you can see clearly written here on cash Federal Reserve note, which basically means the government promises the dollar has value because they have declared it has value by law, which is the Latin definition of the word fiat. Wonderful. So now that we know the difference between an equity-based asset and a debt-based asset, let's explore how Wall Street has started to treat Bitcoin, an equity-based asset, as a debt-based one and why this could be suppressing Bitcoin's price. Hello, I'm CryptoKC, and in this video, we are going to explore how and why the price of Bitcoin should likely be much higher than it currently is, and how this problem can be solved in the long term. Let's hit it. Please be sure to check out our sponsors, OneInch, Tandrum, and Masterworks. OneInch is a decentralized exchange with the best rates that easily allows us to buy any and all altcoins that exist on multiple networks like Ethereum, Binance Chain, Arbitrum, Polygon, and more that are not listed or supported on centralized exchanges, trade altcoins faster, more securely, and conveniently to take profits on the go with Tandrum Wallet, a hardware wallet that is the size of a credit card, multi-currency, multi-chain, and super easy to set up, and diversify your investment portfolio into fine art, one of the oldest asset classes around that has stood the test of time with Masterworks Platform. So be sure to scroll down and use links below to access the correct and official sites, as well as redeem any special offers they have for us. Sweet. Real demand versus artificial supply. If you watch this channel frequently, you know that prices of assets like gold, stocks, and Bitcoin are determined by supply and demand. When demand is high and the supply is low, we see the price of an asset increase. When demand is low and the supply is high, we see the price of assets decrease. But there's something very interesting going on here in the case of Bitcoin. Check it out. Wall Street is treating Bitcoin the same way they treat gold, except it's extremely important to realize that in the scenario of gold, Wall Street and the banks have the gold market cornered and can largely control both the physical gold and paper claims to gold, for now. So let's explore how Wall Street has been suppressing the price of gold for years by piling debt claims on it, and how they have potentially been suppressing the price of Bitcoin using the same antics. Here's the deal. The long and short of it with gold is that there are more paper claims to gold than actual physical gold secured in vaults for investors. Sure, people can buy and store physical gold themselves. However, most of the gold people own is just a piece of paper or certificate saying they own X amount of gold and it's stored in some vault somewhere, likely in another country. And when considering the relationship of the price of assets and supply versus demand, Imagine if the real demand for gold is being met with and satisfied with an artificial supply of gold. Basically, there are more pieces of paper telling people they own gold than the actual physical gold that has been mined and is secured. Right, and that's absolutely how the gold market works. The upper hand Wall Street has in the gold market is they pretty much own, operate, and control all the clearing houses in the gold market. Wall Street controls most of the gold in the world, and by Wall Street, I mean all of the global banks. The central banks in the LBMA, or London Bullion Market Association, control most of the underlying collateral of gold, not individuals, random corporations, or small regional banks. So when anyone wants to redeem their actual physical gold, Wall Street and banks can pretty much trade with each other and fulfill any demand because they control the actual supply. Cool. Now let's talk about the similarities between Wall Street's relationship with gold and Bitcoin. So just like gold, there are currently more paper claims to Bitcoin than actual Bitcoin in circulation. How's it so? Well, with the way the centralized cryptocurrency exchanges work, and with the introduction of leverage, margin, and futures trading and ETFs in the cryptocurrency market, basically Wall Street and big institutional investors are applying traditional debt-based financial practices to an equity-based asset. And instead of Wall Street owning, operating, and controlling the supply of Bitcoin, in the event of a run on Bitcoin, there is absolutely not enough Bitcoin to fulfill real demand because most Bitcoin is actually stored in wallets off of exchanges and out of circulation. So what does this mean? Basically, for every actual Bitcoin that exists on the blockchain, 10 people, 50 people, or hundreds of people could have a claim to that same Bitcoin through an ETF, lending, borrowing, leveraging, or simply by leaving their Bitcoin on the exchange. Literally, hundreds of people could be watching the same exact Bitcoin on their Coinbase or Binance app, thinking and believing it's theirs, when in reality, with one, the development of crypto ETFs, two, the allowance of margin and leverage trading of cryptos, three, 
lack of transparency and oversight of how many times crypto can be lent out and relent out to several people throughout several exchanges, and four, centralized exchanges outright manipulating their own databases to show they have more crypto than they actually have, just like we saw with FTX, there is an artificially higher supply of Bitcoin in circulation. Interesting, right? So let's think about it. If there is real demand for Bitcoin, like all of the hundreds of people who bought and are holding it or looking at the same exact Bitcoin on their account, if all that real demand is being met and satisfied with an artificially higher inflated supply of available Bitcoin, then what is the actual true price of Bitcoin? Well, we've got regular people like us, we've got big businesses, we've got Wall Street, we've got entire countries adopting Bitcoin at an absolutely exponential rate over the past few years, and we are still at 20 and 30k price levels. Highly doubtful, the price of Bitcoin should be much higher, because if you create an artificial supply of something, which Wall Street has done with gold and is now doing with Bitcoin, all else equal, the price of the asset is suppressed. It's, it's that simple. And instead of Wall Street owning, operating, and controlling the supply of Bitcoin in the event of a Bitcoin run, again, there is absolutely not enough Bitcoin to fulfill real demand because most Bitcoin is actually stored in wallets off of exchanges and out of circulation. So check this out. Let's imagine a scenario where Wall Street has largely shorted Bitcoin, meaning they expect the price to go down, but then the price goes up and Wall Street is forced to close their positions regardless of the price of Bitcoin. The same exact situation with meme stocks like GameStop and AMC, that could be a problem. Because if you had a big intermediary like Coinbase or Binance with lots of open leveraged short positions experiencing a classic run on the bank for Bitcoin and there's not enough underlying collateral to deliver, the price of Bitcoin could spike. Spike by a lot. Just like the GameStop short squeeze situation, but on a global scale. These big institutions would be desperately trying to find collateral that they ultimately wouldn't be able to get very easily because it simply doesn't exist. The amount of actual Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain is much different than all the Bitcoin centralized exchanges allegedly hold and with leverage margin and ETFs that just give investors price exposure to Bitcoin. If or when a short squeeze occurs, Bitcoin hodlers would be the last ones laughing. That is why it's so important to make sure you are transferring all of your crypto off of exchanges to hold safely and securely in your own cold storage hardware wallet. Because at the end of the day, only the hodlers that are hodling Bitcoin on their own self-custody wallets, where they completely own and control their Bitcoin, would be having the last laugh. So please use the links below in the description area to access the correct and official sites of my recommended hardware wallets to get your Bitcoin off of centralized exchanges today. Probably one of the simplest cryptocurrency wallets to set up and use that is great for brand new people in this space, as well as experienced altcoin traders, is the Tantrum Wallet. In our altcoin preparation video series for beginners, we did a review and step-by-step -step guide on how to use it, which you can check out by clicking on the link above. Tantrum Wallet is a cryptocurrency cold storage harbor wallet that looks like a regular credit card. And the card is very simple in design, with just a chip, that is an advanced standalone microcomputer with the highest standard of security among crypto wallets known as EAL6+, which is a level of protection similar to that in NASA and passports. The source code of the Tangent mobile application is all available for anyone to view and inspect on GitHub, which is extremely important because with full transparency, we can be sure that there are no built-in backdoors in the wallet. When we activate our Tangent wallet, the chip in the card generates a random private key that neither Tandrum nor anyone can see, view, or know what it is. This card is used each time we need to make a transaction, so the private keys are never provided to any third parties, and the Tandrum app or company also does not collect any information. So the private keys on our cards are never ever exposed, which makes it impossible to steal or trick us out of our funds. So instead of a seed phrase as the only way to back up our crypto wallets, backup copies of the wallet are created and used on other similar Tandrum wallet cards that we encrypt with our own unique access code, which we create for each card. Also note the pricing for this cryptocurrency hardware wallet is much cheaper and more affordable than other ones with free shipping and an option to pay in crypto, which is a plus for any beginners just getting started or anyone who is looking to onboard friends and family into crypto with a simple, easy to use, secure, self-custody wallet. So scroll down and use the link below to access Tandrum's correct and official site, as well as redeem any special offers they have for us. Awesome. If you would like to learn about how to find different altcoins before they pump in the next full cycle, check out this video. If you would like to learn more about tools like Tandrum Wallet we can add to our DeFi toolkit, check out this video. And to get your very own Tandrum Wallet, 
Click on the link on the screen. Like and subscribe for more. Be safe out there.